Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Happy Palm Sunday. Please join me in the welcome and call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. With palm branches in hand, we greet the one who comes to save us from our sin. With raised voices, we glorify the Messiah who comes humbly riding on a donkey. With jubilant song, we worship the King who comes to rule in righteousness and peace. With penitent hearts, we repent before the Lord who is holy and just. With soaring spirits, we rejoice in the God of our salvation. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you sitting on a donkey's colt. Please join me in our opening song of praise, the lyrics for which can be printed in your bulletin, Jesus Messiah. Jesus 
On Palm Sunday, the crowds welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem with the cry of, Hosanna. But on Friday, they called out for his execution, shouting, crucify him. So also our sin has led to Christ's crucifixion. We repent of that sin and we seek God's mercy to absolve our iniquity. Let us pray with one voice. Most merciful God, we have sinned much and are in need of your salvation. We cry to you, Hosanna, save us. We ask you not to remember our evil, but instead to forgive our transgression. For the sake of your humble servant, Jesus Christ, pardon us and restore us in righteousness. Renew our spirits so that we walk in obedience to your word, to the glory of your holy name. We cry to you for mercy. A moment of personal reflection. Hear the good news. God's word declares, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you, righteous, and having salvation is he. In the mercy of Almighty God, his son Jesus was given to die for you. For Christ's sake, God forgives you all your sins and gives you his righteousness, making you holy in his sight and giving you salvation. His mercy endures forever because his love for you is steadfast. It is written in the scriptures, so we may therefore believe God loved the world so much that God sent his only son so that all who received him into their hearts would not have to die forever, but could have everlasting life. And I believe... still have sent his son. This is truly good news, which brings peace to our hearts like nothing else can. I ask you to please share a warm greeting and a sincere sight of God's peace with those here without leaving your seat and with someone you call or meet this week.
It's great to see you all. Thank you. Please be seated. Megan. All right, my turn. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's do our candles first. So can you guys remember what candles we have here? Yeah. What, what do we have? Um, we have, oh, we have what do they represent? Peace, very good. Um, we can turn Hap another word for happy. Excited? Joy. Joy, very good. And what does the big one in the middle represent? Do you remember what the big one in the middle represents? God. Jesus, it's Christ. It's the Christ candle, right? So what happens to Jesus this week? Remember, this is Holy Week. So what do we talk about? What happens to Jesus? Give you a hint. There's a big cross up there. Oh, and he died, right? So we're gonna blow this out, and then on Easter Sunday, what do you think we're gonna do again? Light it back up. Very good. All right. So how many? I know all of you have been to parades, right? You haven't been to a parade. Have you been in a parade before? I You have, yeah. A little parade right so what are some things that we see in a parade balloons what else oh candy very good sometimes people throw candy down at you right that's the best the firemen do yes what floats yep encouragement yeah so what do the people do in a parade what do like the firemen do when we have a big fireman's parade? They throw candy. <laughs> you should know this, Sebastian. They throw candy. They throw candy, but what else do they do? How do they get down the street? Uh, fire. Well, fire truck, but then some guys do what? Some they fire. march. Thank, thank you, Larry, from the back. Yes, they march. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. We are going to have a parade, okay? So what we're going to do is... We're going to get the palms from right there, and you guys are going to hand them out to everybody in the congregation, and you guys are going to march up this row and down that row, and we'll invite anybody from the congregation that wants to be part of our parade. They can be part of our parade, too, okay? everybody and you know what we're gonna do we're gonna wave them and what do you think we're gonna say congregation what do we say Hosanna in the highest right so keep going guys march we're having a parade we're having a parade and wave your palms and as you get your palms wave up and then here I'll get So let's have everybody that can stand and let's shout, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. 
Yes. Here. We're gonna take one. Oh, take one. So. Okay, so now that we did that parade, you guys can, sorry, you can sit down. <laughs> now, guess what? That is pretty much the same thing that happened to Jesus. He rode into town on a donkey and people had palm branches like this, palm fronds, and they laid them down in front of him on the ground so that there wasn't too much dust. And they also waved them in the air and they said, Hosanna in the highest. And do you guys have any idea what that might mean? What do you think it means? Yeah, they were treating him good. So Hosanna means save us, right? So isn't that what Jesus came to do? Came to save us, right? So everybody was so excited to see him that they had a big parade. They shouted, save us. And that's what he did. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for coming down and saving us. And this little parade is just our show of gratitude for doing that. Amen. Today's lesson is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. For maximum understanding, please follow along in your own Bible. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The next day, the great crowd had come to the festival, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when, they call, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. It was also because they heard he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, at the, look the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Eric's not here, not everything gets done. And he with my glasses, I can't read these switches, so I don't know which one is there. Sorry, Eric. Bad Alan. <clears throat> I can't tell you how heartwarming it is to see so many of you here today, especially those of you who have been not able to make it for a while. Thank you for making the effort today. I hope you'll feel up to making the effort next Sunday too. We have been working through a series about God's mercy. And today's message is based on the idea that there is mercy in the palms. 
not your first instinctive reaction when you have been brought up in Sunday school and in church to get all excited and smiley and happy and waving your palm and shouting Hosanna like it was some great celebration. It was for many people a celebration in the sense that there were people who thought with him coming, particularly coming into Jerusalem the way he did on the donkey, that they were finally going to have their rebellion and drive the Romans out. Because the Romans were every bit as harsh as the Russians. And I can't shake that thought as I stand in front of you today. The Romans were every bit as harsh. They were brutal. They killed people for what you and I would consider unjust reasons, capricious reasons. And the people in that day, God's people, wanted the Romans gone, just like Ukrainians want the Russians gone. And we, who care about the Ukraine, want the Russians gone. We have tried to um, focus on praying for Putin to stop. We had the sign out on the board by the street, we have a new one here with a heart-shaped Ukrainian flag saying praying for Ukraine. And we have um, slides that we show during the video that people watch at home. Because apart from praying, there's not a lot more you and I can do right now without starting World War III nuclear. At least that's my opinion. But there is mercy in the palms. Let's think about that. Today is Palm Sunday, commemorating Christ's procession into Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week. A very up experience in terms of people being glad to see him. And the people that were glad to see him were the country folk coming in from out of town to celebrate the Passover. Not the same crowd that lined the Villa della Rosa and shouted crucify him as he dragged the cross with his aching, bleeding back up the hill to Golgotha. It's not like people changed their minds. It's the audience changed. But at this entry point, there was honoring that was being expressed. There was hope that was being expressed. There was light at the end of the tunnel that was being expressed. So as verse 13 says, the people of Jerusalem took branches, or the people coming into Jerusalem, I'm sorry, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're really saying, save us from the Romans. And blessed be the name of the Lord who sends the salvation. Like he sent the salvation to the Jews in Egypt. Other accounts inform us that they spread palm branches on the road, as Megan pointed out, to cut down the dust. Another way, they also threw cloaks down for the same purpose. Kind of like first century version of the red carpet. What is the significance of palm branches for entering into Jerusalem? First off, they weren't these little strips of fronds. They were branches that had those things coming off of them. Yes, like those. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so I forget they're there. Thanks for pointing to them. That's what they were waving.
the significance of palm branches was that almost two centuries before this event, palm branches had already become associated of triumphal celebrations. That is, winners celebrating their win, their victory. In 164, before the Christian era, BCE, that's the way we say it today, by the way, those of you who went to science school in the 50s, I'm sorry, BC is no longer in. It's BCE, before the Christian era. In 164 BCE, palm branches were used to celebrate the rededication of the temple that had been occupied by enemies who were now kicked out. There was that victory of getting them out of town. And the temple was reclaimed by the Jews who were jubilant and had every reason to celebrate. That's 164. In 141, remember the numbers run down as the years progress in the before Christian era. In 141 BCE, the Jews celebrated victory over their enemies by honoring their liberator, Simon the Maccabee with the waving of palm branches, another military and even more military victory. Indeed, the palm branch became a symbol of Jewish nationalism as they saw themselves and their self-image change from victim to victors to being victorious against their enemies. And this nationalism lasted for centuries surrounding the ministry of Jesus. So at this event, Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, palm branches imply the signal of people's hope that a new liberator, a new Simon the Maccabee, has arrived on the scene. And those darn Romans, days were numbered. Today, we might compare the Palm Sunday event to a celebration parade in a big city. It might look like a victory parade following the successful conclusion of a war with military bands marching while confetti and ticker tape float down from the sky, at least for those of us who are close enough to New York City to know what that looks like. Whether it's astronauts who've just walked on the moon or other people that have achieved great things in our name and for our honor. It might look like the victory celebration of an athletic team who's just won a national championship, such as a Super Bowl. Although, that doesn't happen unless it's a New York team. A New York team that probably plays in New Jersey. Na, 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 na. Sorry, I always felt that way since the Meadowlands were built. Or a baseball team that triumphed in the World Series. Crowds gather to celebrate their heroes and to rejoice in the victory. And ticker tape is part of that. I don't understand why all the networks insist At the end of the day of such a celebration, they have video of the guys with the big brooms sweeping up the tons and tons of stuff that was thrown out the windows of the Wall Street businesses and banks. That kind of takes some of the glint off of it for me and, and turns it kind of untidy. My mother wouldn't like that. I don't know about yours. In the ancient world, triumphal processions were a big deal and very impressive. A conquering general would lead the parade in a golden chariot pulled by strong stallions, often white, straining at the reins. This was not an idle pace. This was... Uh, an aggressive, race-like, victorious thing. He'd be dressed in a royal robe. What color is a royal robe? 
Thank you. You're still with me? He'd be dressed in a royal robe and he would smile with satisfaction over his military forces. His children would be dressed in white robes, either, if they were too little to ride a horse themselves, standing behind him in his chariot, or they were riding behind him on their horses. This lead warrior would be wearing polished armor over his purple and he'd be followed by ranks of soldiers carrying banners and flags of their regiments. Last of all would come the captives of the conquered, not the best part of the parade, let's face it, pulling wagons filled with the spoils of war, their former possessions being dragged to the victors for their use and their ownership. All the while, the crowds in the street shouting, Hail! Not Hosanna. Hail! The message of this pomp and ceremony is very clear. The victors deserve glory for their military conquest, based on the assumption that it was for the greater good. We know better than to think that was always the case. But the triumphal procession that took place on that Palm Sunday in Jerusalem looked very different. The center of attention was not wearing purple with his elbow and shoulder and waist joints all covered with highly polished brass. The center of attention was a very ordinary looking man clothed in everyday dress. We would call it humble. Maybe even a little dusty and dirty from the long trip down those dusty roads into town. And he wasn't riding in any great golden chariot. He was riding on a borrowed young donkey not a prized animal, not a prized possession, not a symbol of any greatness. And he didn't even have a saddle, for Jesus sat on a cloak thrown over his back. Luke's gospel tells us that as he approached the city, Jesus began to weep bitterly. Now we, our lesson today came from John, but Luke's includes the awareness of what this all meant and what was at the end of the road, so to speak, for Jesus. And so he began to weep, not so much for himself and the suffering he would go through, but for the condition of God's people and for the punishment they had earned if this didn't work if Jesus didn't make it to the cross, if something happened to change the plan. As some scholars have wondered, if, if Judas hadn't tried to provoke Jesus and his followers to react with swords and clubs and force at his arrest in the garden that was coming on Thursday night. Did you know that? There's some people that are trying to cut, Jesus, cut Judas a break. Because it is true he did run out after the events were all in place for him to go to Golgotha. He went out and hung himself. Nobody missed him, except maybe his mother. How would you like to be Judas's mother? you'd have to move to some place where you weren't known. Instead of celebrating a national victory, Jesus, as he comes into Jerusalem, is foretelling the future demise of Jerusalem. Look specifically at Luke 19, 41 to 44. I'm sure you all have your Bibles open. Sarcasm. Those who welcomed him into the city 
were the blind and the lame and the little children who chant songs. The crowd lining the street didn't cry out, hail to the chief, but rather, save us. Save us from Rome. And the more theologically astute, save us from ourselves. Save us from our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful and good, as I talked about last week. In all our shortcomings and offenses. The prayer of confession right out of the maroon hymnal you all sang from in the 50s. On page three or five, I forget which. Picture this parade, the one that Jesus, not a general, was riding in. A forlorn, weeping figure rides on a lowly donkey, followed by a disorganized array of unimportant, unimpressive, lowly folk who are not the envy of anybody who lived in the city. Can you have a dr more, more dramatic contrast with the grandiose military processions of Rome? What is the meaning of this unconventional procession? What is the message behind this pathetic parade? It communicates that although Jesus is a king, he is unlike other kings of the world. He comes not in military power and conquest, but rather in humility and compassion. And his weeping indicates that this is a pathway to sorrow and sacrifice. Why is Jesus entering the city? Actually, it is to accomplish what the people are crying for, save us. For the crowds call out Hosanna, meaning specifically, exclusively, emphatically, profoundly that, save us. Save us from the evil around us. Save us from the evil within us. Save us. We are needy people. He comes to sacrifice his life at the city where ritual sacrifices are made. There are no more important sacrifices in the life of God's people than those that take place in the temple in Jerusalem. Like the lamb that is slaughtered once a year for the sins of the nation. Jesus comes to sacrifice his life. The ultimate sacrifice, the Paschal lamb, the Passover sacrifice. He comes to save humanity from its ultimate enemies of sin and death and hell. The, prom, the palm, sorry, I haven't had teeth in my mouth for three months and now I have them all back in and my tongue is tripping over them, excuse me. The palm procession took place on Sunday of that holy week, but another procession took place five days later on Friday. Again, the focus is Jesus, but this time he is not carried by a donkey. Instead, he carries something as he stumbles along. Each step, painful. Each movement in his back as he drags the cross, doubly painful. He wears lacerations of a brutal scourging. He's not going into the city of Jerusalem, but rather out of it to Golgotha, the place of execution. And there are soldiers in this possession, but they serve as Jesus' executioners, not as his victorious army. Along this path are many tears from women, at least those are the ones noted in the scripture accounts of the day. 
And the Via Della Rosa, translated into English, is the way of sorrows. Sorrow that Jesus must die for us. Sorrow that we deserve that. We have earned that. We have put him in that position. He wouldn't have to be there if it wasn't for the way we live our lives. Yet Jesus, who had wept for Jerusalem when he entered it now, sets his fate resolutely as he exits it. His face is set to meet his death. Instead of sounding the call of save us, Hosanna, on this day, the crowd cries a pronouncement of judgment, a sentence, crucify him. The worst punishment imaginable, the cruelest form of execution that the Romans could conceive of. It is quite a different procession on Friday as compared to the previous Sunday. What is the meaning of Friday's procession? What is the message of this journey to crucifixion? It is that Jesus will not save himself, though he could. From the beginning of his ministry, Satan has tempted him to do so. Jump off the temple wall. Surely your father's angels will catch you. Jesus will not save himself, but gives himself up as a sacrifice to save others. He is the Marine who jumps on the uh, grenade that has been thrown in the midst of his company, of his closest buddies. The Marine who throws himself on top of that so that he absorbs the concussion and his buddies are spared. He is the sacrificial lamb who gives his life as a ransom for many. Sunday's cry of save us is fulfilled in Friday's cry it is finished. It is finished. Can you imagine the emotion in his voice and the feeling in his heart as he says, it's done, it's over, it's accomplished. It is finished are the words that bring us our salvation. It is finished is the pronouncement of the victory over sin and death. It is finished. Palm Sunday is not only an event of the past, it is the promise for the future. The Bible envisions a day in which people from across the globe will honor the one who died for them with palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7 verses 9 and 10 gives this depiction. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. That was impossible to count. People from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of the Lamb, clothed in white robes. White robes meaning the children of the victor. With palm branches in their hands, salvation, they cried out, belongs to our God who sits on the throne, who is King and Lord. And to the Lamb, the sacrifice. To the King and the Lamb. Both. It is because of the Lamb who was slain that we have salvation. We couldn't have it any other way. It would not have come to us. We'd still be in deep, pick your own word, we'd still be in deep. It's because Jesus Christ went the way of the cross for us 
that we have been rescued from sin. It is because our Lord died the death we deserve that we will now live eternally. Today, on this Palm Sunday, 2022, we cry out, save us. Because Jesus trod the path from Jerusalem to the cross for us. One day we will join with the heavenly throng to cry out, salvation belongs to our God. And in our hands we shall hold palm branches to honor the one who has saved us eternally. All because of Christ's mercy, the mercy of the palm, all in view of God's mercy. Amen. As those present in our sanctuary prepare to present their offerings here, may you who are not with us physically please consider mailing an offering to us at 51 West Blackwell Street in Dover, New Jersey, 07801. And if you have not yet done so, whether or not you send a special gift just for Ukraine, please know that this year coming shows the probability of what we've already experienced in the last 12 months which means that the Presbyterian Hunger Program is going to be drained to the bottom because of all of the need for food. And the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Fund is going to be drained to the bottom because of all the fires and all the floods and all the tornadoes that are ripping towns to shreds. It's not over yet. And the Self-Development of People Fund all three of which come from your gift to the one great hour of sharing. Self-development of people being that program where we help poor folks with hope and ambition and an idea to go into business for themselves and hire people in their impoverished towns so that they have an income so that their standard of living is raised, so they have a future. Give a person a fish and they eat a meal, teach a person to fish and they eat for a lifetime. Self-development of people. Those needs are going to be as great and we're gonna be tempted to just think about Ukraine. So please think about one great hour of sharing. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the great deeds of salvation that you have done and continue to do. Bless our offerings of thanksgiving this week that they may further your kingdom in this world. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Good morning. We welcome you to First Memorial Presbyterian Church and invite you to join us next Sunday for Easter services at 10 a.m. right here at 51 West Blackwell Street. This week's birthdays are Jason Madison, Denise Reidner, Tom Bailey, Michael Chelbus. Anniversaries are Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Bailey, and Mr. and Mrs. Anthony Rega. Prayers of peace and hope during this holy week for us, we start with Good Friday, and our friends of the Jewish faith who celebrate Passover starting on Friday as well. Prayers of comfort for all who have lost loved ones, prayers of healing for those who are ill, or recovering from operations. And special prayers for Ellen, Nushabi, and Tony. And our list, Alexa, Alice, Angel, Andrew, Ann, Artie, Barbara, Benjamin, Bruce, Brian, Catherine, Christine, Claudette, Darlene, David, Debbie, Diana, Dick, Dominic, Donna, Dawn, Enie, Eddie, Ellen, Florence, Gary, Gina, George, Helen, Irene, Jay, Janet, Jonathan, Jody, Joanne, John, Jasper, Joe, Karen, Ken, Kim, Keith, 
Kathy, Larry, Linda, Lynn, Lily, Morgan, Nancy, Nishabi, Nora, Owen, Peter, Pat, Paulette, Paul, Rick, Scott, Sarah, Stephen, Taryn, Ted, Terry, Thelma, Tina, Tony, Tracy, Walter, Wayne, Riona, John, Bajay, and uh, Patty. Thank you, Kim. And I would like to add that <clears throat> for whatever reason, God has been playing the names and memories of uh, family and friends this, all this past week um, who have crossed the threshold from this life to eternal life um, in, a, in a more profound and, and inclusive way than I have experienced before in my life. And it includes people who are not part of my immediate family. And I would ask you to join me in joining Karen and Tom, who will be remembering their son on Good Friday, which is a special day for them. Hope that didn't upset you. We believe, so we pray. Oh God, you give us cause to celebrate life and faith every day. For each day begins with light pushing back darkness. Indeed, there is no dawn without darkness. Maybe the darkness for us is a combination of the memories of the evil events of previous days, and the dawn is the beginning of a new day with the hope of better tomorrows. While well, this day carries a special burden this Palm Sunday, a burden that marks six weeks of memories of hardship and cruelty which only seem to get worse with the passing of each new day, yet this day brings hope. Hope that things will not continue to be as they have recently been forever. For recent days have not been unfolding God's way, but the way of a sinful humanity God has never allowed any evil enterprise in history to last indefinitely. Biblically and otherwise, every evil enterprise in history has been brought to a conclusion at some point, usually at the cost of life, whether that loss be great numbers of soldiers and civilians, and never without the shedding of a great many tears to show how much we love. God has never allowed evil to triumph over good, and he has promised that he never will. So we must continue to live in the hope he promises and wrap all our hopes in prayer, such as the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our parting hymn is on the back page of your bulletin, page number 10. Tell me the stories of Jesus.
Hear again these words and hold them in your heart. The God who came to Bethlehem still comes to us. The God who spoke with a human voice over 2,000 years ago still speaks to us today because the word, God's word, became flesh, took on human form to dwell among us. He is with us here and now, and he will be with us wherever we go from here. Amen. And I leave you again with Billy Graham's words, which mean so much to me. He said, when it is our time to leave this earth, we can believe we are going to heaven, not because of anything we did, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Please have a seat and reflect during the postlude.